welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. If you would, let's stand to our feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this church service. Thank you for your presence. Almighty God, we just worship you and we honor you today, God. Thank you for what you've already done. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further. We want to go farther with you, Lord. We want to go deeper into the things of God. So we pray that as we approach and open your word, God, that you open it up to us. Open us up to receive it, God. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand, God. We'll do our part and be diligent and listening and, and in paying attention, God, giving our interest, God. And we know that you'll do your part. Thank you, Father, for the word of God that can encourage and build and guide and direct and motivate our lives, God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that teaches us and illuminates us to receive the wisdom of God and not the vanity of man, Lord. We give you praise and glory, God. How wise you are that you can speak an individual word to each and every person in this place. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We pray that you build them and encourage them this day. Speak to them as you would speak to us, God. For we're laborers in your kingdom building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord Jesus. We love you and we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. And get your Bible out and go with me to the wonderful text of Hebrews, the fifth chapter. We've been in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, for quite some time now. For those of you that are just joining us, those of you that are new, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. And uh, we believe that God wrote it that way. We ought to be able to understand it that way. When this was written, this was a letter. This was not chapter and verse. And therefore, we don't want to just bounce around. We want to find out what it is that the Word of God has to say to us. And so we build brick by brick, principle upon principle, line upon line, precept upon precept. And at the end of that, you find out that God has built something stable, something strong in your life that will hold you up when the hard times come. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Luke was in verse number 11. We're going to start in verse number 11 and, and launch into the first part of verse number 12 today. And let's read this together. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number 11. And speaking of Jesus, speaking of the, the Melchizedek priesthood, the heavenly priesthood, the new order in the kingdom of God, it says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain. Since you have become dull of hearing. Now, remember a couple weeks ago, Pastor Luke brought a brilliant message about how to become sharp, how to stay sharp as hearers of the Word of God. And he brought out these principles. And, 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 and we learned that it wasn't hard to explain because there was a problem with the Word. It wasn't so lofty or, or such a, a celestial concept that we earthly beings were not capable or, or able to handle it. No, that, that's not true because the Bible says that spiritual things are discerned spiritually. And so we have the capacity to be able to understand these things. So they're not a problem with the word. It wasn't a problem with the writer. Writer knew what he could say. Writer knew how to express things. It wasn't a problem with the writer. No, this was a problem with the hearers. And what was the problem? Well, it says, since you have become dull of hearing or slow, slack, uh, uh, slothful hearers. They, they, they had, had, had become stagnant in their walk with God. And because of that, the author of Hebrews couldn't continue on into the things that he wanted to get to. He wanted to get to the high priesthood. He wanted to get to the access we have by grace. He wanted to get to the, the fact that we can enter into the most holy place and that we can go to him outside the camp. He wanted to get into that and what our, our priestly ministry is linked up with Christ. And yet he couldn't do that. Why? Because they had become dull of hearing. Let's read the next verse. Verse number 12. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. Today, the title of today's message is The Danger of Staying Dull. See, there's a danger if we don't progress in the things of God. And, and the writer of Hebrews starts to tell them, you guys ought to be teaching this stuff. You're, you're spiritually mature enough. You have enough of the word of God. You've had enough time. You, you have the maturity level that you should be able to go and teach other people these things that I'm talking to you about. And yet, because you're dull and because you've slowed down and stopped progressing, you need to be taught again. Someone needs to come back to the ABCs with you and, and teach them to you again. Why? Because you haven't incorporated them into your life. See, sometimes as Christians, we think that just because we've been in church for a number of years or because we know some things about the gospel, we can talk about Jesus Christ, we can talk about the cross, we can talk about the timeline and the history of the Bible, maybe we know some, some of the books of the Bible, that sort of a thing. We think that we've got all that down, now we can move on past that stuff and get into the deep things of God. But the problem with that is, is that, uh, let's use a natural example. 
As kids, we all learn the ABCs, the one, two, threes, all that kind of stuff, right? Did you ever stop using the ABCs? You say, well, I stopped learning them. Yeah, why? Because you incorporated them into your life. Anyone who comes along and tells you, I don't need the ABCs any longer, I'm past that, hand them a book and say, try and read this to me, right? You can't read a book no matter how difficult the reading is unless you still have a grasp of the ABCs. Is that true? Okay. So that means that you can't move on to trigonometry and calculus unless you've got the one, two, threes down, right? You can't move on to the biology and the chemistry unless you've got the ABCs down. In the same way, in our spiritual walk with God, we cannot progress, we cannot move on to the things that God wants to get us to unless we have the basics down. And that's why a couple of weeks ago we learned how to stay sharp. Remember, talking about hearing the word of God, practice, practice, practice. That's the one that stuck because he repeated it three times. Study, get in, and you do the will of God. You apply the word of God to your life. And the danger of staying dull is the danger of not progressing, getting stagnant in our walk with the Lord, eventually becoming useless or even worse. As we get into the, the sixth chapter of Hebrews, we're going to find out that there are worse things that could happen if we stay stagnant, if we stay dull. So we need to continue in the things that we've learned. The Word of God talks about this in Second Peter. You're there in Hebrews. Turn a couple books back towards the back of your Bible through James and First Peter, and, and then you'll find Second Peter. Second Peter in the third chapter. Second Peter chapter 3. We're going to be in the end of Second Peter chapter 3. Peter's been writing about what happens when people start to get off track, when, when, when uh, false prophets come in and, and people who, who uh, aren't sticking to the word of God, who are unstable, starts to talk about the outcome of their lives. And now, 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to take a look at verse number 15 and verse number 16. Chapter 3, Peter starts talking about how uh, the Lord is coming back and how we ought to live our lives because the Lord is coming back. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 says, And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Now notice Peter acknowledges the apostle Paul and says, Paul has been given some wisdom. And Paul has been writing and he's been teaching you about these things. Now the next verse, verse number 16 comes along and says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand. Now, there's that terminology again. Remember, it was difficult to explain in one sense, and now here in another sense, he says, hard to understand. Why? Because there's a problem with the word? Is it so lofty that we can't get it? No. No. We can spiritually discern these things. Is it, is it a problem with the preacher? Was the apostle Paul so lofty and, and used $20 words that the people couldn't understand? No. No. Hard to explain. Why? Which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Wow. So there wasn't a problem with the word. There wasn't a problem with the preacher or the writer. No, there was a problem with the hearers. What, how, what was the problem? The problem was they were untaught. Problem, they, they didn't have the ABCs down in their life. And so when they got a hold of these concepts that were hard to understand, now they started to, because they were unstable, they started to twist them to their own destruction. We ought never to twist the word of God to, to, to get in line with us. No, we need to get in line with the word. God will not line his word up to us and to our way of thinking. The God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't repent or, or change. No, here's God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here is the almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega. He, he is the, the one there whom there is no shadow of turning. And therefore, God doesn't line his word up with us to fit our thinking, our way, to make us feel good. No, we've got to line our lives up with God and get in line with the things of the Lord. And notice that it says they twist to their own destruction. It's like taking a knife and trying to bend it around. What's going to happen? You could cut yourself. You're going to get hurt. You're going to bleed because that is a double-edged sword, and it can cut you both ways if you try and twist it, try to distort it. We should never twist the Word of God to line up with us. We need to line up with the Word. And, and the way that we combat this unhealthy, stagnant, dull life, the way that we're going to progress in the things of God, the Bible says is through teaching. He says you ought to be teachers, but you have need of teaching. You need somebody to teach you the first principles are the oracles of God. Now, we don't use that term, oracles of God. That's not something that we, maybe you've been watching The Matrix and you think of the oracle as a lady in some room somewhere that, that comes along at the right time and says something, you know, kind of crazy, but somehow it works. That's not what the word of God is talking about, okay? Really what it's talking about, the oracle of God you'll find is the place where God speaks. 
So we've got to get back to the place where God speaks in order to be taught to understand and to progress in our spiritual walk. In Solomon's temple, the, the most holy place where the presence of God was was called the oracle of God. That's the place where God speaks from. And so in our lives, if we're going to find where the place where God speaks, well, that's, that's right here in his word. He speaks right here in his church. He speaks through the things that we've been taught, through those ABCs. God is telling us something. God is speaking something to us. God is doing something in our lives. So we need those oracles of God. We need the place where God speaks in, incorporated into our life. And the goal is, is that we'll eventually not just be taught, but that we will become teachers. Notice he says you ought to be teachers. You ought to be doing something. You ought not just be sitting on it, but you ought to be using it, applying it, and now instructing others. And the greatest lesson that you will ever give to anybody as a teacher is your life. Hopefully a lot of you just went, <gasps> why? Because you're saying, Pastor, I can't be a teacher. I can't do what you do. I can't stand behind that pulpit. I can't prepare a sermon. I cannot preach. I cannot teach. I can't prepare a lesson plan. I, I, I couldn't even stand up in front of the kids over there and teach. That's not my gifting. That's not the way I'm built. That's not what I do. I'm not into public speaking. I'm not into any of that kind of stuff. I can't be a teacher. And yet, we're not talking about you standing up in front of a crowd. Some people will never stand in front of a crowd of people and teach. That's not your call. That's not what God wants from you. No, but your life that you live as you incorporate the principles of God into your life, now that will be your lesson, that will be your instruction to the people around you on how to be a Christian, on how to live a life for God. Husbands and wife, here's a great example. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Peter chapter 3 that women with their godly conduct can speak to their husbands even though they're not saying anything. It will teach their husbands that they, without a word, noticing your godly conduct, will obey the word. Wow. Then it goes on to say, likewise, husbands, or in the same manner as the women adorned themselves and lived a godly life and spoke to the husband the things of God without saying a word, likewise, husbands, you also ought to dwell with your wives with understanding. Or in other words, you can do the same thing by living your life godly that your wife will now know and learn from you. Same thing with parents and children, raising your kids. Man, those kids are going to grow up and do the things that you do, good or bad. They'll get all your best traits. Oh, but they will get all of your worst traits. Why? Because monkey see, monkey do. It's the way it works. And so the best lesson you're ever going to teach to anyone else is through your life, through living a godly life in Christ Jesus, out there in the marketplace, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, with your relatives, anywhere that you go, your life speaks, your life teaches others about what you believe and about what it is that you're all about. So I thought it'd be kind of fun today to take a look at some traits of teachers. If we're going to be teachers, we ought to find out some traits of teachers so that we can incorporate these things into our life because we ought to be teachers. We ought not to have to go back to the ABCs and incorporate those again and learn those again. No, we should incorporate those into our lives and become mature, strong, healthy, and progress, not stay dull, but to go on and become what God has called us to be and teach others in the way. Are you listening today? All right, three of you guys are. How about the rest of you guys? Are you guys here today? Are you listening? All right, praise the Lord. Traits of teachers, number one, is a dedication to learn. Traits of teachers, number one, is a dedication to learn. A great teacher is always learning. We are lifelong learners as, as Christians. We're never going to get everything this side of heaven. Why? Because the Bible says we know in part and we also prophesy in part. We, we don't understand it all. You know why that is? Because we, we're not this... We're not on the spiritual side yet. We're still on the physical, natural side. We haven't seen heaven. We haven't seen God face to face yet. We, we haven't had those, those encounters with Jesus personally face to face. It's been a spiritual thing that we've had encounter. We've had encounter in our heart, but we have not physically seen his form. We have not seen him here in the flesh. And, and, and there are things that, I mean, just open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Try and explain that. You can't. Why? You weren't there. I wasn't there. Okay, so God created the heavens and the earth for seven days. All right, were those literal days? Were those ages? Were they, I don't know. Why? Because I wasn't there. And that's one of the things you're going to find out about great teachers is that they have no fear of the term, I don't know. Why? Because, hey, this side of heaven, we're always learning. We're lifelong learners. We're always going to be growing. We're always going to be developing. There's always going to be something new, new revelation that we can pull out of the Word of God. Now, there's nothing new under the sun, but to us, 
We're learning this. We're growing together. We're finding out. That's one of the great things. Sometimes people say, well, I, I don't want to be a teacher because I'm afraid that if somebody asks me a question, I won't have the answer. Well, guess what? If you don't have the answer, here, pressure's off. Here's the answer. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Jesus does, but I don't. Here, here's another answer. I don't know, but let's find out together. Oh, now all of a sudden you got them. Because number one, you've shown them that you're real and you're not a hypocrite. Because if they think that you're a know-it-all and that, that you've got it all together, you're all that in the bag of chips, right? They're, they're going to be like, uh-uh, no, I don't want nothing to do with that. Because nobody's like that. You know, I, I, I can't identify with that. But if you come along and you say, hey, I, I don't know, but let's learn it together. Now all of a sudden you've got something. You've got somebody that you can teach. They can learn. Wow, I don't have to have it all together immediately. I don't have to be perfect to be a Christian. I can be just me and come to Jesus with my insecurities, my fears, my frustrations, my life, even my sin. I can bring that to him. And he can clean me up from the inside out, and we can grow and we can develop in the ways of the Lord together. Are you listening? Amen. We see this in the Word of God. You don't have to turn there. I'll put it up on the overheads for you because I'm going to put it up in a different translation, the God's Word translation of Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. Very familiar verses when we look at these. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through verse 17. And let's take a look at it in, with the eyes of a dedication to learn, that we're always learning, that we're always growing, always developing. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17, in God's Word translation says, verse number 12, it's not that I have already reached the goal or have already completed the course. Now, many times we think about this in terms of running, right? Because he's talking about running a race and he's, he's, he's running, he's pressing on and everything. Think about it in the sense of a teacher or a student, somebody who's in a class, right? He says, not that I've already reached the goal or have already completed the course. See, see we're in the school right now of God and, and we're in the middle of our course. We're, we're still learning, we're still growing. We're still developing. We haven't finished the course yet. But look at what he says. But I run to win that which Jesus Christ has already won for me. Verse 13. Put it up on the overheads for me, please. Brothers and sisters, I can't consider myself a winner yet. This is what I do. I don't look back. I lengthen my stride in verse number 14. And I run straight toward the goal to win the prize that God's heavenly call offers in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. Whoever has a mature faith should think this way. Notice he didn't say a dull hearer should think this way. No, whoever has a mature faith should think this way. So what is the mature position that we take that we don't have it all together, that we haven't already attained, but we are pressing on towards the goal? We're going to learn. We're going to grow. We're going to develop. We're going to move on with God. doesn't matter if we failed in the past. We're going to succeed in our future. Why? Because we're learning. So whoever has a mature faith should think this way. Now look at this. And if you think differently... Are you listening? If you're not mature and you think differently, God will show you how to think. Oh, my. That means that God is the great teacher, and he's going to correct you. Why? Because he chastens the child that he loves. He corrects and disciplines us. He won't leave us stupid. God wants to grow you up, wants you to be mature, wants you to be strong. He wants you to grow healthy in the ways of God. He won't allow you to continue to harm yourself, but he will teach you in his way. Let's read on. Verse 16, however, we should be guided by what we have learned so far. In other words, in New King James Version, I think it says that we should live up to what we have already attained to. In other words, the ABCs, the one, two, threes, the addition, the subtraction, the multiplication, the division that you already have learned, continue to use those things in your life. You don't put them away. You, you incorporate them on a day-to-day -day basis. Things like repentance from dead works, things like baptism, things like uh, uh, you know, faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ, all those basic principles. He says, just get those in operation. Get those rolling around in your life. Get those continuing on in, in your walk with God. Verse 17, brothers and sisters, imitate me or learn from me. Watch what I'm doing and do the same. And then he goes on and pay attention to those who live by the example we have given you. So you want to learn how to do something? You want to learn how to study the Word? Get around people who know how to study the Word. Ask them, how do you study? They'll tell you, I read. They'll tell you, 
I write down what I've learned. They'll tell you. I, I, I go to a, a different translation. They'll tell you. I, I look up commentaries. Or they'll tell you. I, 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 I ask someone else. I've got a friend who, who knows a lot about scripture. Or they'll tell you. I go to the cross references. Or I, 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 I bring a, a dictionary with me because I don't understand the English language, let alone the biblical language. So I've got I to gotta find this out. See, different people study different ways. So if you need to find out how, get around somebody. Get, uh, I don't know how to pray. I, I can't pray that good. I'm not a real prayer person. Get around somebody who's passionate in prayer. You find out what is it that they do? What is their passion? What is their intensity? Are they praying the scripture? Are they praying the word? Are they, are they asking God for things? Are they, are, are, are they just thanking God? for what, what are they doing in their prayer life? You want to find out how to witness? Get around somebody who witnesses. Listen to what they're saying. Start incorporating those things. Find out how they overcome objections and how they're ready with an answer. My goodness. See, pay attention to the people that are around you. Start learning from their life. And then eventually you'll get that incorporated into your life until all of a sudden somebody's watching you. You're here today. Amen. Traits of teachers. Number one is a dedication to learn. Second thing for today, traits of teachers. We're going to become those teachers that God wants us to be. Living a life that speaks to others is diligence in action. Traits of teachers, second thing for today, is diligence in action. It's no good to teach and not do. That's hypocrisy. We've all heard this statement, do what I say, not what I do, right? And, and we hated that. Why? Because that, that just doesn't compute. Why would you tell me to do something and not do it yourself? And yet God never asks us to do anything that he wouldn't go and do himself. Like sacrifice, lay down your life. What did he do in Christ Jesus? He laid down his life for us. Paid the ultimate sacrifice. That's why he had the right to ask Abram to sacrifice his one and only son. Now, he stopped him before he did it, but then he went and he did it himself, and he became the sacrifice. See, in our lives, we have to imitate God. We have to be imitators as dear children. We have to follow the example of God, and therefore, we can't just tell other people, you should be a Christian, this is how you ought to live, and then we're off at the water cooler gossiping. We're telling dirty jokes at the coffee pot during work hours. Or we're slacking and surfing the internet when we should be doing something that we're being paid to do. If you cheat on your taxes, you just lost your witness to your tax man. See, we learn when we see what's going on. More is caught often than taught from words. Uh, think about it this way. How did you learn how to be a husband or a wife? Was it because somebody sat down with a book and opened it up and said, chapter one, this is how you be a husband? No. Most of us never even cracked a book to find out, let alone the Bible, to find out how to be a husband or wife. God does give us instruction on how to be a husband or wife, but most of what we do in our marriages is because we saw something in our parents. And we got all of their good traits, yes, but we also got all of their bad traits, Dad was a romantic, but he was terrible at coming home on time. Dad was, uh, you know, unromantic, but he was on time all the time. Chances are you're going to be the same way. How did you learn how to raise kids? Was it because somebody sat you down when you got pregnant and said, okay, let's open this up. This is basic baby 101. This is how you change the diaper. You're going to need to know how to wipe the snotty nose. You're going to need... No, no one did that, right? How, how did we learn? We learned because... We saw something. We saw our parents. We saw how they raised us. We, we know what we liked in them, and then we started to imitate that. But man, if they had a temper with, with you when it was time for discipline, don't you know, all of a sudden you're shouting the same words at your kids when you... Am I just talking to hear myself talk? <laughs> we know those things that were shouted at us, and all of a sudden we find ourselves shouting them at our kids. Why? Because we caught it. We weren't taught. It wasn't just with words. It wasn't just with a lesson plan or anything. We caught it. Think about it in these terms. When you learned to drive, right? It, it, did they sit you down in a room there at the DMV and say, okay, here's your book. I'm going to give you that long, narrow book, you know, and, and it's kind of newsprint. And you, you go through it, and then they give you a test. You sit down, and you take that test. And then, and then did they say, all right, you're good. Go drive home. What would happen if they did that? You'd be in trouble, Right? Why? Because you would sit down, you would turn that key, and man, you would slam that accelerator and go right into the DMV probably because you didn't know what to do. It would be disastrous. No, what did they do? They sat you down in the passenger seat first, and they said, okay, here's your 
blinker, here's your mirrors, check your mirrors, make sure that your seatbelt's locked in, check behind you, check all around, make sure that you're safe, this is the accelerator, pedal gently, you're going to press on this, and then this is your brake, make sure to pump it, make sure that they're working, all that kind of stuff, why? Because they're teaching you, they're training you, you're catching something when you're in the car, now what do they do after that? They switch places with you, you sit in the driver's seat, they sit in the passenger seat, and now they say what? They say, okay, click your seatbelt in, check your mirrors, check your blinkers, check your lights, check your brakes, okay, now you're going to put the car in reverse, that's the little letter R right there, now take your foot off the brake and gently press the accelerator, right, what happened, <laughs> why, because you've never felt that before, you've never experienced that before. And so there's a trial and error that they run you through. They, they say, okay, that was, that was okay. It's all right. We're all living. You didn't crash into anything. <laughs> now, when I say gently, I mean gently, yeah? And so all of a sudden, you're starting to learn why. Because you're catching something. You're feeling something. You're experiencing it. Chances are, if you want to find out how to be a good friend, you'll get around people that you like, people that treat you a certain way, and you'll start to mimic those things that you like in them. They, they, they were friendly. They, they, were, they were conversing with you, and you start to converse with others now. They smiled a certain way, so you start smiling that way. They, they gave you a gift, and so all of a sudden, you're excited to get them a gift. See, it's all caught and not just taught. Matthew chapter 5. Let's take a look at it in a word. Matthew chapter number 5. Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter number 5. It talks about this very subject, being diligent in our actions. Matthew chapter number 5, we're going to take a look together at verse number 19. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 19 says these words. It says, whoever, everybody say whoever. whoever. That's whoever, right? doesn't matter who it is. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments... And teaches men so. Shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now think about this for a second. They break the commandment and then do they go and set up a platform and say, all right, everybody, I want to tell you about what I just did. Okay, this is how you break the commandment and you need to break the commandment this way. No, they don't do that. What is it? They broke the commandment. They approved of it by their actions. Other people saw and learned from their actions and their lifestyle and now they start to do the same unhealthy thing, right? So whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But there's an opposite side of that statement. He goes on to say, but whoever, everybody say whoever. whoever. Say, that's me. Okay, we kind of lost like <laughs> three quarters of you guys there. Let's try it again. Everybody say whoever. whoever. Say, that's me. that's me. Okay, there you are. All right, but whoever does and teaches I'm sorry, whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So whoever does the commandments and teaches other people to do so. How do you do that? Because you sat down and you said, okay, this is how you obey God. This is how you do the things God. No, because you lived a life that taught a lesson to all the people around you. Things are caught and not just taught with words. Are you listening today? Okay, traits of teachers. Number one. Dedication to learn. We're lifelong learners. Second thing, diligence in action. We get busy doing the word of God and teach people with our life. Final thing for today, number three, traits of teachers is a devotion to teach. A devotion to teach. Now, oftentimes we think about devotion as something like, you know, a morning devotion where we sit down and we read and we study the word of God and we pray and all that kind of stuff. And you might be thinking, God, that does not sound fun to me at all. I'm not a teacher. I'm not built that way. I don't like to read. I like to watch movies. I, I like to listen to music. I'm creative. I'm not structured. I'm, you know, I I'm not any of that. And so how can I be devoted to teach? Think about it this way. Devotion doesn't mean just sitting down and studying and that sort of a thing. Doesn't mean preparing your lesson and getting ready to go tell somebody something. No, that's not what this is about. What this is about is having a devotion to teach. Devotion means an enthusiastic loyalty to a person, an activity, or a cause. You think about the devoted fans of OU back in Oklahoma State. I mean, they're painting their houses black and orange for goodness sakes. But, but their neighbors, right, that, that, that are uh, Oklahoma University, right, they, they're, they're painting their houses red and white. 
I mean, literally, you can drive down a street and you can see their devotion because they're so enthusiastic. They're painting their houses those colors and hanging flags, right? And it's like, my goodness, you guys are crazy, OSU versus OU. You see the stadium filled with people. They're screaming. They painted their faces, all that kind of stuff. Why? They're speaking with their actions about what they're all about. It got so crazy that one of our coworkers when we were there in Bible college referred to the team as I and we. We were like, what are you talking about? Oh, man, I just haven't been passing. I, I haven't been following through. I haven't been running the play. I'm sorry. Are you the team? You know, and it just, it was crazy to us as Californians. We don't have that kind of devotion to sports. But if we're devoted to teach, that means that we're so excited, so enthusiastic about our walk with God, that we're so filled with the things of God, that now all of a sudden we want to go out and we want to tell others about Jesus. We want to encourage other people with our life. And, and they get excited about the word of God. They get passionate. They get blessed. And then they go out and they teach other people and they start to pour in their lives. And they get excited and passionate about the word of God. And they go out and they teach others. And, and on and on and on and on. See, this is the greatest pyramid scheme that the world has ever known. It's not a worldly principle. It's a biblical principle that we would be infectious and contagious Christians that you can't stop the spread of what we're doing, of what we're saying, of what we're teaching. We're filling the whole world with our doctrine. Why? Because we're excited. Because we're devoted to teaching others about the things of God, living a life that speaks to others and sharing with them the love of Jesus Christ that they can walk in that same way. Let's take a look at it in the Word, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you will. You're there in Matthew. Turn back towards Hebrews. If you hit Hebrews, come back a little bit to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to take a look at verse number 2. Kind of easy to remember, 2 Timothy 2, 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 2. Look at the Apostle Paul speaking to a pastor by the name of Timothy. Timothy was like his right-hand man for a long time. He left him in Ephesus, and now he's writing to him. These are kind of like his last words to Timothy. Take a look at what he says. He says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, the things that I've taught you, Timothy, remember those things? Remember those principles? Remember the basics? Remember how we went on to the harder stuff too? The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, Commit these to faithful men or teach these. Impart these things. Be excited and passionate about telling other people about it. Why? So that they can just have it? Oh, no. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So in other words, Timothy, the things that you've learned from me, I want you to pass on to faithful men who will pass them on to others also. See, it just continues to grow and to grow and to grow. How many people will your life affect if you start pouring into others right now? Start telling someone else. Start training someone else. Well, who do you teach? Well, how about your kids? Teach your children. For time's sake, I'll put it up on the overhead. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 9. It says, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. So in other words, remember, hold what you got, the things that you've already attained to, the things that you already know. Let's live by that rule. Now look at this. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Wow. See, it would be enough for us. We would say, yeah, I, I taught my kids, and then my, tids can, my, my kids can teach their kids. That's how we think. But the Bible reminds us that not everybody has all the answers. And even though you trained your children, your children at the age that you were when you were raising them aren't going to know what you know now that you're on the other side of that and you've seen the results of that. So there's wisdom with age, and now you can come and not just teach your children, but also you can teach your grandchildren. See, it goes much beyond your generation. Now, all of a sudden, you have a purpose. Now, all of a sudden, you have a place. See, sometimes people get older, and they start to think, well, I'm, I'm irrelevant. No one wants to hear from me. I, I can't say anything. They're, they're, I don't look as cool as they do, those young guys, you know. I can't say. No, listen, we need the wisdom that you have. Why? Because you've been there. You've done that. You're on the other side of it. You know the outcomes, and now you can impart that wisdom into the younger generation who has the energy to go out and get it done, but, but you may not have the energy, but you may have the wisdom. And now all of a sudden you can impart that, and we all together can build the kingdom of God. Are you listening? See, you're more influential than you know. You have more impact than you, than you can even understand or comprehend. God wants to use you in a mighty way. He wants to use your life to speak to others. Who do you teach? Well, teach everyone you can. Last verse for today, 2 Timothy chapter 4. You're there in chapter 2. 
Turn a couple pages over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll end with this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. This is why this is so important. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, I, cha- I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. See, this is why this is so important, because God is coming. Jesus is coming back. We need to be ready. We need to tell others. Verse number two, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? Teaching. Wow. So don't just get ready with your life. Get ready with your words too. You need to start telling somebody. You need to preach the word. You need to convince. You need to exhort. You need to be after it. You need to be living it. You need to bear with people. Love them through their trials. Love them through their problems and their issues and their hang-ups. And teach them how to walk in the way. Verse number three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. My friends, we are living in those days. People are not putting up with the sound truth from the word of God. People are going off after every crazy doctrine you can imagine. They're writing books and putting them in Christian bookstores. Never just allow yourself to be spoon-fed or forced-fed somebody's ideas where they pull one scripture out and they have a pet doctrine that they want to champion the cause and they start to twist the scriptures and bend the scriptures. Why? Because that's going to end in their destruction. Stick with the word of God. Check everything out. Listen, if, if someone in this pulpit says something that doesn't line up with the word of God, you don't go with that. You go with the word of God every time, okay? That's the encouragement. Keep the word. Check it out. Make sure that there's more than one witness in the word. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. Make sure to understand the whole counsel of God, not just one little scripture out of context. Oh, that means this. No, you don't twist the word to get with you. You line up with the word. Last verse, last verse, verse number four. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Stories, fairy tales. Start believing things that are, are just absurd. Why? Because they become dull of hearing. That's the danger of staying dull. But we're not going to stay dull. We're going to get sharp. We're going to incorporate those ABCs. We're going to continue to listen to the Word. We're going to study the Word. We're going to practice the Word. We're going to do the Word. And we're going to become teachers. What are the traits of teachers that we saw today? Well, number one, we saw dedication to learn. Number two, we saw diligence in action. And finally today, number three, we saw devotion to teach. If you got something from the Word of God today, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys. Thank you guys for staying. Thanks for staying put. You, you said something with your life right now. You just taught other people around you. Those of you that got up and walked out, I know I got speakers in the foyer and back there in the bathrooms and out all the way in the breezeways out to the courtyard. Hey, you guys stop and listen up too because you said something with your life right now too. And I want you to listen up because your eternal destiny is at stake. I want to ask you guys a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What if today was your last day on the earth? What if you died? Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart silently. No, 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 the answer but you, God. Now, some of you answered that question and said, well, you know what? I think I'd go to heaven. Somebody said, maybe I'd go to heaven. I, I don't know. Somebody said, I, I hope I would go to heaven. I really do hope so. The problem with that is nowhere in the Bible does it say. Nowhere. Check it out. That you can think, hope. Or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. You got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt how to get there. Sometimes people say, well, I know I'm going to go to heaven because, you know what, uh, all roads lead to heaven. You get there your way, I'll get there my way, we'll all get there some way. And, and you know, God loves us all, therefore, just do whatever you want to do and, and we'll get there. It's cool, that's truth for you. I've got my own truth. And as long as we live by it, we'll make it. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven? It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Drive around as long as you want, you'll never make it to the moon. Only one way you're going to get there. Same thing with God. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. Not all roads lead to heaven. We've got to get there one way, and that's his way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. You know, I, I don't think a good God would send people to hell. Well, he doesn't. Hell was never intended for you and I. It was intended for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And we can choose with our lives where we end up. And just by burying your head in the sand and denying hell's existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to deal with the reality. Today, come on, we can deal with that. 
I'm not going to go stand on the freeway and say, I don't believe in trucks. I don't believe in trucks. I don't believe in trucks. Listen, stand out there long enough. You'll meet one face to face. Come on, let's talk. Hell's a very real place. We see it in the word of God. Jesus talked about it. Old and New Testament. Therefore, come on, let's make sure you don't end up there. Sometimes people think, well, if I'm a good person, God will let me into heaven. I know God lets good people into heaven. I've been a really good person. You know, I used to be a rascal. I used to be bad, but cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. Done a lot of good things. Helped my neighbors out. Been friendly to people. Uh, got involved in charity work and, and social justice. That's great. Glad you did those things. But just show that to me in the Bible where God lets good people into heaven. How good do you have to be? Where's the grading scale? Where's the curve? Is it in the back of the Bible by the maps? It's not there. Nowhere will you find this is how good you have to be or do this many good works and then God lets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. It's not about how nice you are to your neighbors, friendly, help out, give money to charity, get involved in social justice. It doesn't matter. Listen, not going to get you into heaven. Because the Bible tells us that our good works, when compared to God's goodness, are like filthy rags. They're going to get thrown out. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it just by being good. I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated. Don't get distracted. This is your eternal destiny at stake. Come on, pay attention. Some of you might say, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. They, they hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? And you've always considered yourself to be a Christian. You went to religious classes like Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. And maybe you are baptized or christened as a child. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say be raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you Christian. Nor in the Bible does it say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. Come on today, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you would say, well, Pastor, I get that, but you know what? Uh, uh, I didn't just attend when I was a child. I'm sitting in church right now, sitting in front of you. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm sitting in church. I wouldn't have came if I wasn't. While I understand your thinking, show that to me in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That's like saying I can go sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. Never going to happen. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, well, okay, I, I, I get that, but you know what? Not only have I sat in church, I got involved. My last church, I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, taught in the Bible class, even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things, but just show that to me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven, where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teach in the Bible classes, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. God's not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter heaven. Simply does not work like that. Some of you might be thinking, but I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life, sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. It's great. That's wonderful. I'm glad you can do those things. But just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you can quote some scriptures, celebrate a holiday, sing some songs. That that gets you in heaven. If you'd read your Bible, you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself is recorded in the Bible as knowing who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. Come on, look up here. It's not about what you have in your head, having head knowledge or mental assent towards God, knowing who he is, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day who was a good guy, raised in his church called the synagogue, did a lot of good deeds in his life. In fact, he, he got involved in his church and became one of the leaders. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And, and people looked to him to find out about God. He was a teacher in Israel. And yet when Jesus comes and speaks to this great man, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, rather, what does he say? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, raked it through the coals in movies and television and books and magazines and on the internet. But listen, I'm not concerned what with, with what society and the media says about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. 
It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you better look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected, vomited from the mouth of Jesus. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Here's your opportunity. I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your cue to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed, but get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And ever, no one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? No, not going to do it. Remember, if you confess me before men, Jesus said, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up, I'll count it, you can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. But if you deny him, sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right, he will deny you. Your call, your choice. I've done my job, I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job. Sending Jesus beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? You say, Pastor, you're pushing me. Yeah, I am. Here's why. Because the devil's pushing you the other direction into hell. And I don't want that. You don't want that. So come on. Let's go for God today. That's why we're so passionate for you. It's because we know the terror of the Lord, the Bible says. So today, will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise your hand? You've never done this. Never given God all your heart and life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. You can do that in this safe and friendly place. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on. You can get right with God today. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together wherever you're at. Watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, online. Man, wherever you're at, come on. Get ready to get your hand up telling us right afterwards or come into the church service. Or click the button that says respond to God online. For those of you that are in the house, come on. I'm going to count your hands when you pop them up. Family rooms front to back, left to right. Come on. Get ready. Here we go all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. There's two up there. Got you right there. Anybody else real quick? There's three. There's four. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? There's five up in that family room. Thank you. There's another one up there. Thank you. Six. Anybody else? Seven. Got you down here. Thank you. Seven wise people already. There's eight. Got you up front. Eight wise people already. Eight wise people already. Come on. If, I, if I'm not seeing you, get my attention. Give me a little wave or something like that. Anybody else real quick? Got about eight, nine. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Up there, up top, ten. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. About ten wise people. Real quick, come on. If you need to, thank you. Got you, eleven. Eleven. Where you at? Number twelve. Number twelve back there. Got you up there. Thank you. God bless you. Thirteen. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? About 13 wise people. We're at number 14. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should do this. Come on, go for it. Go for it. God just spoke to you right now. Showed you what you were thinking. You know you need to respond. If that's you, just pop it up. Number 13, number 14. Anybody else real quick? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't miss this. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Thank you up top. I might have been stretching, but I'll count them anyways. Praise the Lord. There you are, number 14. God bless you. Number 15. Hey, hey. Hey, you, you, you were sitting there, your heart's pounding out of your chest. You said, if he gives one more call, I'll do it. Hey, here's your call. God's speaking to you right now. Number 15, come on, where you at? You know that God just spoke to you. Where? Got you right here. Thank you. God bless you, my friend. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do real quick. All 15 of you, you number 16, 17, 18, 19... Hey, it's not too late for you too. Even if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. And once you get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle, no one leave during this time. You're saying something to the people and you're saying something to the Holy Spirit if you leave. Saying, I don't, I don't care, I don't respect that. I want my thing more than God's thing. Allow them to come forward. We're showing them that we want them 
to have a strong relationship with Jesus Christ, teaching them something about etiquette in the house of God. So no one leaves. Let them come forward. And let your neighbor say, hey, if you need to go, friend, I'll go with you. So let's all stand. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. Lord, I give you my Come on. You can come too. I give you my soul. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. I'll live for you. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Every Every moment I'm away. They're still coming from the family rooms. Bring your kids. Come on down. They'll remember this. From the foyer. Come on in. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Come on, come on, come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Every breath that I take. Come on, come on, come on. And every moment I'm away. All right, all right. Hey, if anybody else needs to come, just make your way to the front and listen up while I give these directions. Hey, everybody up front, look up here for a second. Put a big smile on your face. It's not a bad thing. This is a good thing, all right? Right over here is a friend of mine to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel L., okay? Like Noel, Joel, all right? He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? All right, this is about as weird as you're going to experience today right here. He's cool. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to pray with you, a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, give you some free literature, free information that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Easy reading. You can find out what to do next. I'll give you one of the things is get back to church, okay? And then finally, he's going to give you a friend. Yeah, you heard me right. He's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at The Rock. That's just how we roll, all right? And, and, and what we do is we give away friends, and we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym? Helps you get strong and buff, right? The spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Teach you some things that will help you get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to your old way, but that you go on with God's ways, all right? Now, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year, one year of your life here at this church. You say, but I got my own church. Well, what are you doing here today? And, and you responded to God here in this church. You heard the voice of God. And if you would have died in your old church in the condition of your, you're in, would you not have gone to hell? So, hey, give us a year here at this church, sitting under the teaching here at The Rock. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, I promise you, God will give that back to you. You'll be so blessed. You'll say, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Love you, Pastor Joel. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.